most of the reporting and writing that I'd done had always been through the prism of the politics with the church, with the religion on the side. Uh, and I wanted to sort of turn that on its head a little bit and try to really put the focus on the church. Uh, and then just at a personal level, for me, uh, having grown up uh, as a PK in an evangelical household, uh, really grew up steeped in the evangelical church, I think I just had a lot of questions about, uh, you know, about the way that I had seen my own uh, church community uh, evolve over the years. Uh, most of the understanding of the evangelical world uh, is shaped through a handful of figures uh, at the national level, people who are very high profile, very visible, who I, I think in many cases are sort of detached from maybe the grassroots of, of the evangelical movement, if you want to think of it that way. And so what was really important for me here was whatever judgments were being rendered, I wanted to make sure that we were capturing those from the ground up rather than from the top down. I writing about religion. I've spent a lifetime thinking about religion, but this is really the first time I've ever actually dedicated a, a good chunk of time to doing the reporting and, and really thinking this through and putting it on paper. So uh, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really grateful and, uh, and, and really humbled to, to have you all recognize my work in this way. Name. He was a household name, but we didn't really know much about him besides that he wrote that book, maybe that he was a pastor at the most. Um, and I just found that really compelling, you know, in, in an age of Instagram influencers, you know, celebrity pastors, and a lot of ministry leaders as personal brands, I found his humility really compelling. And uh, around that same time, CT had just produced our Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast that was really popular. And that was right in the wake of publishing some really hard pieces about Robbie Zacharias and some other fallen ministry leaders. So I just wanted to encourage our readers with a story that served um, almost as a foil of those cases. Yeah, so the more I researched him, or at least in the beginning, I often thought to myself, how do you make a boring guy interesting? <laughs> um, you know, the way I wrote the story was I, I profiled uh, Gary Chapman by visiting him in person, uh, and that helped me include as many personal details as I could, anything from, you know, his daily calisthenics routine to the fact that he loves to garden and has a little writing um, cabin. And so I tried to discover almost, you know, what's the formula for faithfulness, which in reality is live the Christian life, be a person of discipline and integrity. So. Um, one quote that uh, I'll read from a reader in Singapore said, he said, we have a phrase, wary watchman versus winsome witness. The church is usually good at the former and we get the latter, but a story like this does both well. So I was really grateful for that it hit the target. And so I'm really grateful to see that there are other um, authors and writers doing the same thing and that there's a place that really wants to support the work that uh, we're doing. Long story. I was reporting in El Salvador on the situation there with the gangs and the violence and, and how things were kind of just going out of control. And I was at a local jail and I started talking to some of these guys and it became clear that the only way that they were allowed to leave the gang was through the church, which kind of blew my mind that this was such a acceptable thing to do. Story, right? You have these two gangs that are kind of infamous for their levels of, of violence and, and just sheer kind of depravity. And then you have this escape escape mechanism that's through the church and these guys have to do this complete 180 from who they are into who they're becoming 
and it's somehow accepted. And, you know, it, it's just one of those stories you hear and you can't get out of your head. And I was like, I have to, I have to learn more about this and look into it. First of all, I wanted to be on the ground. You know, I felt like I had to be there and talking to these people. And I wanted to get the experience of just seeing what it was like for them. I wanted to hang out with them as much as possible. You know, it's not also a thing that's so cut and dry. I want so that's always what I aim for is to find people dealing with these circumstances and kind of persuade people that are, that are back home kind of how lucky they are to not be there. And also, you know, just find a way to, to sympathize with them and be like, wow, you know, what would I do if I was in this situation? Um, And so I just want to thank everyone involved with the Zenger Prize. Uh, and, you know, I, I obviously um, was reading about, about Marvin and Susan uh, and the Alaskans in general. And it's just, uh, it's pretty amazing. You know, I'm, 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 I'm grateful to them. I think Marvin is sort of like a, a paragon almost of journalism. You know, he's taken a pretty brave stance and made sacrifices uh, for it. So, you know, knowing that as well, you know, that's the kind of people that in this industry, I think that I admire who kind of stick to their convictions in that way, no matter the cost. So yeah, it's, uh, and I wish I could wake up every day and found out I won a prize like that. You know, it's, it's terrific. And I'm really thankful to everyone at the organization. Yeah, for years I had been uh, following closely the stories about exonerations, wrongful convictions, and this sort of thing. Um, but I want it to be about more than just here's an, here's how the system failed or here's how an injustice was done. I want it to be like really, really much more a, a human story, something about the human spirit. And and so as I looked around from one story to another, I stumbled across a relatively short news article about this Richard Phillips and about this idea that he had learned to paint these beautiful paintings while serving uh, such a terribly long um, wrongful prison sentence. And it just made me want to know more. It, I, I just had a human fascination with what he was doing. And um, I thought, can I tell a kind of story that maybe is a little different from the others that were much more about the legal procedure. Um, here's just going to be the story of a, a, a man's life. And so that's what I wanted to do here in a couple Alive. You talk about street level reporting. I went all over the streets of Detroit, knocking on one door after another, after another. It took weeks and the deeper I looked into the story, not only the more disturbing it got in, in, in all the twists and turns that kept Phillips in prison that long, but the more uh, his human dignity shone through, through all of it, uh, as hard a life as he had, even before he went to prison, uh, I learned just how there are some people who can't be broken and I think he was one of those people and I was inspired by that. Jesus Christ set what I think can be a pretty good example for journalists today, 2000 years later. Uh, he did two, two big things uh, that, that I really think a lot about. He lifted up the poor and powerless, and he fearlessly challenged the powerful and the corrupt. And what better way can we as journalists take on our work? Um, it's an example that um, resonates with me all the time.
because there have been a, there have been and continues to be a lot of attention in the border crisis, whether it is a crisis, whether it's not, um, what to do about um, the the thousands of asylum seekers um, and migrants at the border. So I have been reporting at the border for about. 11 months when I wrote this piece. Um, so it really came from, I think this came from me in my own journey of understanding um, what's at the border and, and just life at the border and um, being able to see it with my own eyes as a, as a journalist. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's very similar to actually giving birth. This is my first child. And when I, was, when I found out I was pregnant and I was seeing the, the ultrasound, um, it's very hard to fathom this as a human being. You know, they look like aliens in this little ultrasound picture. I'm like, okay. And, and it isn't until he's born and then I see, hear his first cry and like actually see his eyes and touch his face that there is a, a, an additional component of like, man, this is a real human being. This is, he's actually real. Like, and I think that was what I was trying to emphasize in this column um, that yes, I am reporting on a very broken immigration system. I am re reporting on very complex policies, but beyond that, beyond that intellectual part, I wanted to get down to just the dirt. Um, like literally to into the dirt and and I w I really wanted to bring the readers with me into this border camp in Matamoros and see through my eyes the kids there like and 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 that's why I wanted to describe that scene with just the 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 the, the little children from Guatemala who are just playing in the dirt um trying to play play ball with me and 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 just my little interaction with them to just underscore that these are human beings made in the image of God. That's it. This, I wrote it five years ago, um, shortly after it happened, um, and I told myself that I was just going to sit on it. You know, a lot of it was personally processing for me what had happened and thinking about things. And uh, when the leaked Dobbs memo um, came out, there was just a lot of discussion and things I felt like I really wanted to say. Um, and I realized that I had kind of said them already, um, at least to myself. And so I, I dug it out and I looked at it and I said, okay, you know, um, it's, it's been five years. I've had time to reflect on this and I still think it's valuable. Uh, the, the way I wrote it was just trying to lay things out. So that way, you know, people who read it could feel the tension and the struggle that I felt in my own life, um, as I was going through things and processing them. Um, and then also, feeling that sense of hope um, that, uh, that I learned through the process. Uh, and also I really, you know, but I really wanted to build to the end, to the conclusion, you know, which is about my hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like I said, I've been, uh, you know, reading the Alaskis writing since I was 12 years old. Um, so, um, you know, to have them recognize my work is pretty cool. Um, and you know, I, like, I'm, I'm really glad that there are people out there that really deeply care about good writing and good journalism.
story because I had been reporting down in Georgia on politics there for several years. And I was working on a book uh, about the history of Georgia politics at the same time. So those two things converged in a lot of different ways. So I wanted to approach this story in a clinical way uh, and with a uh, commitment to trying to go no farther in what I wrote than what I had been able to confirm through reporting. And, and then I wrote the piece in also in a clinical way because I, I knew that the only way to, uh, to reach skeptical readers would be to take that very methodical approach and, and to write it in a, in a as straight as possible manner. Well, I am really honored and uh, grateful to be one of the uh, award winners for the inaugural Zenger Prize. And I am thrilled about the mission of the Zenger House and its focus on uh, street level reporting on what we used to call back, you know, 20 years ago, shoe leather reporting. I think it's incredibly valuable and, uh, and vital for American democracy. So.